Hi everybody, welcome to Evening TV. I'm Evening Ransom. It's Christmas Day. It's a little bit quieter out on this busy road, so I thought I would come sit in front of the Christmas tree one more time and see if I could get a video in. And one of the things that um, I've been requested to do and I haven't done yet, and this seems like a really good time to do it. It's a spiritual time, wondering where do things connect and all of that stuff. And so I was thinking that this would be a really great opportunity for me to retell my near-death experience story. All right, so let's get started. Back in 2001, and there, for any of you that have watched my videos, know that I had a complicated uh, family situation, which I was not really fully understanding yet. It's all gonna come to me in this near-death experience, so which makes it somewhat unique. Everything that you would expect to have happen with your family, with your spouse, and when you die and almost almost die or do flatline in front of people and then are revived, uh, doesn't happen with me. And it's a very bizarre story in that way. I had a spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which is a very rare thing. Uh, it's a kind of a heart attack in a way, except that it's not caused by a blockage, it's caused by an artery breaking that in my case, it was just purely caused by heartache. I seriously was dying. My heart was literally breaking. I was so depleted and I was so depressed and I blamed myself for the depression. I didn't know why I was so depressed. I was trying to get help. I was, I was un, I, a therapist couldn't really have helped me because I was so unaware of what was going on that I gave them nothing to go with, you know, nothing to work with. So, you know, I'd go to therapy and I'd be like, I don't know what's wrong, my life is perfect. I must need medication, there must be something wrong with my biochemistry, you know. And so I was taking antidepressants with that one doing no good and whatever. Anyway, so um, one day I had spent the day um, with my parents and my oldest son at a exhibit in Seattle. And I, was, I woke up that morning and I was just exhausted and I didn't know, I, it was like the, it was the weirdest exhaustion I had ever felt in my life. It was like, it was like gravity was just pulling on me, like the, the, the world had like twice as much gravity as it ever did, I could just barely move. But I, I, I went to this thing and, uh, you know, spent the whole day just dragging myself through the day and nothing would help, you know, and I'm just, this is so unlike me. So um, I get home, finally I get home, and my husband is there with my youngest son. He had gone to pick up my youngest son at my brother's house, which is across the street. And I was real happy to see him because he wasn't coming home much anymore. He was staying away a lot and not sleeping on our bed and, you know, just really always really unhappy whenever he was around. And he, this time he seemed upbeat. He seemed kind of upbeat. I was happy to see my little boy, you know, all that kind of stuff. So. I get the kids to bed, it's, you know, it's bedtime, I get the kids to bed, grab the mail, come up, come up to back to the bedroom where my husband is watching t TV, and uh, I'm going to, you know, talk to him about his day. And I just barely walk through the door, and all of a sudden, I just get this huge chest pain. It's just, I mean, it's like nothing I've ever felt before. I drop the mail, it just scatters all over the place, and I, I'm like clutching my chest, and my, and I say, I think I say chest pain, like that. And my uh, husband says, you know, sit down, you're gonna give yourself a heart attack. You know, he doesn't move, but he said, tells me to sit down. So I do, I sit down. And, uh, and I say, hey, you know, will you go get that, that family medical guidebook thing that we have, you know, it, which I just discovered this thing that we had. In medical terms in our life, we had, this was, it was happening in a series of traumatic events. We had just had, and we were just, had just been at the epicenter of a really big earthquake in our town. And, you know, our town had been the epicenter of this earthquake. And it actually, it was in this earthquake that I found, after the, you know, the aftermath of the earthquake, that I found this book that we had there that was like basically track your own symptoms and, you know, diagnose yourself kind of a book. And so, um, I found that book. And so, uh, he begrudgingly gets up and goes down, you know, gives a few sighs and goes and gets up. So anyway, he um, takes me through, you know, a flow chart basically. You know, are you experiencing this, are you experiencing that? We flow through, go through it. And I'm you know, still clutching my chest. And he's, he diagnoses, um, you get medical attention immediately, you are having a major coronary event. And then he takes off his clothes and gets into bed. So, I'm kind of trying to process the whole thing and 
because he doesn't say, well, let's get in the car, we gotta go, I, I just say it must not be that big of a deal. I, I go, oh, you know what, great idea. You get some rest, I'll go in the guest room and see if it doesn't get better. Now, the funny thing about this was, as I said, he wasn't even sleeping in our bed. So he hadn't got, so he's, he's getting in our bed, obviously thinking, oh good, she won't be home tonight, so I can sleep in the bed. You know, this is not computing to me though. I, 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 was, I don't call the ambulance, I don't call an ambulance, I don't drive myself, because if I go my, it just says too much. If I have to go to the hospital, if I'm having an emergency, and my husband is able to go to sleep while I'm having an emergency, while I'm actually virtually dying, that just says too much. That tells me that I'm unloved, and I cannot be unloved. I have to tell myself that no matter what's going on, there's some excuse for it because these people love me, you know? The people that I've devoted myself to, that I've put, you know, you know, built my world around, they love me. And so there's, there's got to be some explanation for what they're doing. And in my case, the explanation is it can't be that serious. It can't be that serious because if it was serious, surely he would be concerned and he'd be telling me to get in the car. Okay, so I go, just like I said, I lay down the guest room. It just gets, it's just an unbearable pain. It, look, it's going down my arm. My arm feels like it's broken. And it just, you know, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Recently, my husband had told me uh, something about, you know, I can't read your mind. You can't expect me to, you know, read your mind. And this, this occurs to me. And I go, oh, I didn't say to him, it's really serious. I need to go to the hospital. So he can't read my mind, you know? That, I can't blame him for that. So I'm happy again. I go into the room. I try to like very quietly, gently wake him up. Go through the dark, you know. We lean down. Go, hey, honey, honey. It is. I think it's really pretty serious. I think I better get to the hospital. And he goes, Well, what are you waking me up for? You're a grown woman, aren't you? You've got a car. Jesus. And I said, You're right. So, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I woke you up. You know, I have been I have been neglected and mistreated by by him. It, you know, it's, it, 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 as it goes with narcissistic abuse, it's a deep. It's a he didn't marry me and start doing this immediately. This was a, a slow process of giving me less and less and less over time. We've been married nine years at this point, and. Um, so, you know, it, little by little by little, we worked up to this, you know. He wasn't it the first year watching me die without doing anything, you know. But at this point, this isn't that far-fetched to me. Plus the fact that my, I had grown up in a neglectful family, a narcissistically neglectful family. So my health concerns and my well-being really had not been a major factor to anybody really ever. I go down to kiss my boys goodbye. I really don't know if, I, I don't, I'm not sure that I'll ever see them again. You know, that's the truth. Part of me, I'm really torn because part of me thinks I'm relieved. Part of me thinks, oh good, I'm gonna be done with this. I don't have to, I don't have to suffer anymore. And I didn't have to kill myself, you know? At least this is, you know, no one could blame me for this because it just happened. Okay, what I realize is you're, there's, that's not true. Because if people wanna blame you, they can blame you. Anyway, and I, I discovered this, I discovered this. Uh, but, but then, you know, I, I just can't, I can't go there yet. And I, I, you know, I think to myself, my sons need me, I can't die, which is true, but I'm kind of even starting to wonder about that because there been, I've been getting put down so much that I start thinking, you know, everyone's blaming me in the family and I'm just completely a scapegoat. And so I think, I'm so broken, you know, maybe I'm holding my kids back. You know, no one's telling me that I'm a great mom. They're telling me that I, you know, that I shouldn't be depressed, that I am wasting, you know, resources and money by going to a psychologist that's totally self-indulgent. There's nothing wrong with me, nothing wrong with my family, you know, and the fact that I feel this way is just, you know, um, you know, I'm just a problem. I'm just a problem and maybe my kids would be better off without me. So I am not at this point at all aware or convinced that I am a great mom, that my kids, that my love is different than my family's, that, you know, anything like that. So I'm not so sure that I am a great asset to my kids. So, you know, but I'm thinking, you know, at least as far as responsibility goes, I'm the one who takes care of them. And I'm not sure anyone else wants to take care of them. So I need to be around to take care of them. And so I get myself to the hospital, you know. 
I get myself to the hospital and I, you know I used to work at an ER and I was trained that when someone walks in with chest pain you drop everything and you get them triage. They get you cut in front of the line of everybody. So I'm completely self-conscious about this. I don't want to do that. I feel like I'm rude. I feel like I, you know, I'm going to do that and then it's going to be nothing or something. And so, you know, what I'm, you know, so worried about is what I do, I go in and I say, I have chest pain. And they said, uh, you know, it was, I didn't need to be concerned because they say, okay, have a seat. <laughs> they don't, they don't rush me in or anything. And so um, I sit there and I sit there and I wait for a long time. And I mean, hours are just clicking by. This originally happened maybe between eight and nine in the evening. And I'm guessing now it's, you know, getting close to like one or two in the morning, you know. So, um, and the other thing was is that I didn't go to the closest hospital. I went to uh, the one that was across town because my mother went to the closest hospital and I didn't want to embarrass her. I didn't want to embarrass her or I didn't want to like uh, force her to act like she was really concerned or anything like that. If I went to the other hospital then I could be a little bit anonymous and she could be, um, she could come if she wanted to but I wouldn't be forcing her and she wouldn't have to act like any certain thing. Like we wouldn't be expecting her to be like, oh you're concerned about your daughter. You know, everyone that she knows wouldn't know about it. You know, so I go across town, and um, which turns out to not make her happy at all. She ends up being like, "Why didn't you come? To my, you know, come to my hospital?" Like, I don't know. She thought that was somehow ne a negative thing. I could put her down, or that I was saying that her, this hospital is better than that one, or something like that, which w was never the point. But anyways, I, you know, and in the meantime, I eventually do get some EKGs and stuff, all by you know, lab techs and stuff like that, and they're just telling me that things are normal. No one's telling me anything's wrong. And so uh, they put me in a room finally to wait for a doctor. And so I'm waiting and waiting. And it, it, now it's starting to get close to when my husband has to leave for work. And so I start getting concerned because, you know, if, I, if I'm not home and he has to deal with the kids and all that and not go to work, he's going to be really mad. Now, the other thing about this was we owned our own business. He was the boss. Yet I'm still really concerned about this, you know. He could easily have said, my wife is in the hospital, I gotta go, you know, I can't, you know, I'm going to take my wife to the hospital, I'm not sure, you know, whatever, he's the boss, right? But I'm really concerned about how mad he's going to be if I don't get home. So by the time the doctor comes in, I'm already getting dressed to go home. I'm like, he's like, you know, can I help you? And I go, you know, he didn't have any idea even why I was there. Nobody even told him there's a woman in, you know, sweet 22 with a chest pain. No one had even told him that. He had no idea. I go, well, um, I guess you can't help me. I don't know. The EKGs, I guess, are fine, so I'm fine. I don't know what I'm going to do about this chest pain that's going down my arm, but apparently I'm fine. So I, my husband's got to go to work, and i got to go. And he goes, oh, uh, that concerned him a little bit. He goes, okay, um, let me just get some quick blood tests, and then uh, you know, let me just get some quick blood tests. Okay, so, you know, this concerned him, clearly. He comes back really fast, really fast this time he comes back, and he is as white as his lab coat. He is, he is you know, totally pale, and he says, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but you've clearly had some sort of a major heart attack, you know, some kind of big deal heart attack. I called the cardiologist, he's on his way over, uh, but, you know, I'm glad you're here, we're going to, you know, whatever. So I call home, call my husband, I said, well, I had a heart attack, and he goes, no shit. <laughs> That's what he says. Uh, you know, uh, before I go into surgery, that, so I have to do emergency surgery. Surgery. Before I go into surgery, my parents and uh, my parents and my husband show up, so they get, they see me before I go into surgery. Um, I go into surgery. I'm awake for the whole thing. I'm awake for the whole thing. They have to tell me like, turn right, turn your head left, you know, turn your head, whatever, because they're doing something. And I watch the whole thing, and it's kind of kind of amazing. There's one split second where it hurts really bad. And that's where they're attaching the, the thing, but uh, then that's it. So I come out, I survived the surgery, this one, with me in the recovery room. And the doctor comes in and he tells us that I've had this spontaneous coronary artery dissection. It wasn't really, uh, nothing I really did wrong. It just sort of it was a fluky thing that happens. And basically it, um, you know, it's basically where something tears apart. They basically had to put it together. Like they kind of put it together with the Chinese finger trap kind of thing, a stent, where they sew the pieces of, uh, the, uh, the, the sides of the artery together. It was the it was the left uh, descending artery, so it was the great big one that go. You know, it was seriously. And he did say it is really a miracle that you are alive because he says they we call this the widow maker. If something happens to this, usually people don't live. And this thing that usually this particular diagnosis that you have is usually diagnosed post mortem because the first symptom is this major heart attack. So he says you're very lucky to be alive. Um, 
you know, and he's talking to my husband and I like we are just a regular couple, and he's, you know, that he's sure my husband is very concerned about me and all this kind of stuff. He says, you know, uh, you know, she's gonna be fine. Just, uh, you know, if you want to do anything, it would be reduce your stress and um, don't do any hormonal forms of birth control. So, you know, probably best for him to handle the birth control. Okay. So, uh, you know, which of course it never happens, by the way. The doctor leaves, and my husband says to me, well, it looks like you need to change a few things. So he's already, you know, weeded out completely what the doctor said, and now he's blaming me. He's totally blaming me. And, you know, it wasn't like he said, we need to change a few things, or I'll be home more, or gosh, I'm so, so, I'm so happy you're still alive. That was so scary. No, none of those things. He's not saying any of those things. He's blaming me, and it's not that clear that he's that happy that I'm alive. That's the truth. So uh, the only thing left to do in this procedure is that the, uh, the catheter that they use to do the surgery, they, do that, they put that in my femoral artery, which is the big artery in your, in your thigh. So they, the, and the catheter is still in there. They don't remove it because I'm all pumped full of blood thinners and they, you know, I could, I could bleed to death if they just, you know, removed it. So it has to sit there while they let the blood thinners wear off and um, I have to not move at all because apparently if I move it can puncture my heart or something. So they're like, you have to be completely still for 12 hours, okay? So they give me some sedatives and stuff to do that and um, it's also, just by happenstance, it's the week of Easter. So the, this is now Good Friday. It's Good Friday when they come in to remove the catheter. And uh, so, they come in and remove the catheter. And who, it is not, the doctor doesn't come, it's a nurse that comes, and it's a great big male nurse, a, a big male nurse with a booming voice and giant, you know, giant hands and giant arms. And he's got with him an older, an older kind of veteran female nurse and then a nurse, uh, student nurse, like a young nurse is kind of shadowing the two of them. And, um, you know, this procedure is considered to be very low risk, very minor. It's kind of like removing a cast or removing stitches or, you know, some kind of very, very low, uh, you know, not, is a very common thing to do, I guess, and, and not a big high risk thing and, you know, whatever. So this is a good thing for the student nurse to watch and they don't need a doctor and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, they come in and, and uh, my, the, doc, the nurse says to my husband, my, my husband was like kind of on my side, down by my side, and he says, you know, we move up, uh, up, you know, by your head. So he comes up here and the nurse is down there. And uh, he starts kind of fiddling around with the catheter. And, and I noticed, you know, he's just a really big man. His arms are as big as my thighs. That's how big he is. And, uh, but I kind of turn away because I don't want to, I don't want to look at, you know, I'm kind of squeamish. I don't want to look at all that stuff. So. I'm looking over here at the female nurses, and I'm just kind of watching them. They're kind of chit-chatting about Easter, you know, like, you know, what are you doing for Easter and all that kind of stuff. And they're wearing kind of pastel colors. They're wearing their Easter scrubs. All of a sudden, their faces change. Their faces look real serious. And he says, it's a bleed. Hold her down. He tells my husband, hold her down. So my husband pins me down to the bed, and I look down. And there was a lot of blood, a lot of blood, bubbling up to the surface and coming out of this femoral artery. And it's coming out fast. And uh, he says something about the bed won't raise. She's got, she's been, she's got too much blood thinner. The catheter was too big, um, different things like that. He's pressing down on my body and it is excruciating. He is pressing down on my body trying to stop this bleeding. And I'm just like, oh my, and I hear things cracking and snapping in my body. And I'm just like, why are they doing this to me? I say in this kind of dazed, you know, and, uh, and the next thing I know, I'm up above myself. I'm up above looking down at the whole thing. And I see them take my husband and escort him out, out the door. And then I see that outside the door is my parents, my grandparents, and my father-in-law. They're all outside the door. And so they escort my husband out to go be with them. And all this is verifiable because they, apparently my grandparents came because they were there to volunteer in the hospital. That's the hospital where they volunteered and they happened to see me on the census when they came to volunteer. So they just, you know, happened to be there. And so, um, and I don't know why my father-in-law, but apparently he was the one and only person that got called because no one else ever even knew this happened, it didn't seem like. The crash cart, I see, the, I see a crash cart coming in and because I had worked in a hospital, I knew what it was. I, I you know, I knew what it was. 
apparently there was a code blue call. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear the code blue call, but uh, but it had to have been because that's what the crash cart comes for. So I see the crash cart coming in, and then I and then that's it. I don't I don't see any more about what's uh, what's happening. And then I'm kind of whooshed away, and I have no pain anymore. I am completely calm, and I just feel enormous love, and it's just beautiful there. It's just perfect there. I can't see myself. I don't have any, I don't really have any sense of self, really. I don't have any sense of like the life that I just left. I don't think of myself as a mother with two kids behind, left behind. None of that. I don't have any sense of that. Uh, what I, what I feel is the only sense of self I have is that I belong here. This is where I belong and this is where my family is. And they are so excited that I'm coming home. You know, this is home, this is where my family is, and everyone's super excited to see me. And that there's just tons of unconditional love there. And it feels wonderful. And I am so happy. And so, um, you know, I just don't have any idea what happened. I, this, is, this is just where I am. And as far as I can tell, I, well, I, do, I do seem to have a sense that it's new. You know, like it wasn't like I'd always been there, but I'm certainly, I belong there. And it, in, in, in a way, it is familiar. You know, it is familiar. And I see, I don't see anyone that I know from my earthly life, but everyone I know, I, everyone I see, I do know. The only thing that greets me is this really giant figure. I mean, really giant. Hard to say how giant, but he carries me like a baby. Like he carries me, even, like, even smaller than a baby. He carries me like a, a little, Thumbelina, like a little, <laughs> like a little thing, and he, and he carries me close to his chest, and I can feel him and feel him. He's too big for me to see his face. Like I, I, I cannot see a face. It's a man, though. I definitely feel a male presence. I feel a male presence, and it very much feels like a fatherly presence. This is very much a father figure to me. Um, I don't know if I just have imposed that. I don't know, but it very much feels like a father, and he, he is talking to me like a beloved child. All these questions that I have, I know the answers to. Every question I ever had in life, I know the answer to. I know exactly how it works. And, you know, it's just amazing. We're moving, we're moving through, but I'm not walking, he's carrying me. And we're moving through space, you know, like, we're moving towards something. We're moving, well, what I believe is that we're moving towards this party, where there's gonna be this, you know, I'm celebrating that I've arrived. I hear music, there's music, and it's the most perfect music. It's just unbelievably beautiful music. And everything that you see, everything that I experienced was like, I experienced through all of my senses. It was like, I could taste the music. I could hear the colors. And the colors were amazing. The, color, the colors were beyond anything you'd ever seen here. I mean, it, it, but it wasn't, but here's the thing, it wasn't scary and super, supernatural unlike the earth. It wasn't like a scary, weird place. It was, it was like the earth only, only, more beautiful and without any ugliness, without any pain, without any strife, without any sadness, without any anger, without any, it was just all pure love. Pure love and pure beauty there. No conflict, no unhappiness, no anything, and everyone just loved you unconditionally. You were just surrounded by love angelic kind of creatures above me in this blue, this sort of blue black sky up there. And they're, they're up there and they're singing. They're singing something, it's, I don't know exactly what, but it's gorgeous. It is a gorgeous sound. And then we enter into kind of a corridor and it's kind of white on all sides, but there's sort of a pinkish, um, cloudy kind of, I don't see the ground, in other words. I don't see the ground. This is kind of covering the ground. We're kind of floating through, through this space. And on all sides, I see my life my life playing out and it's informing me of my life because I don't remember, you know, so it basically it's informing me, you know, this is the life you lived and, and I was young, you know, I was, I was, I was only, uh, you know, basically 30 years old and I was the mother's two little kids and all this stuff, but they basically said that I, he was pleased, he seemed to be pleased with the life that I'd been living and about going back and I was like, I don't want to go back. I want to be here. This place is fantastic. I don't want to go anywhere. I want to be right here and I want to go to this party and all this stuff. I want to, you know. And uh, then he shows me my kids and where the, what would happen to them if I didn't go back. And what I see is I see that my kids are surrounded by the family that we have back on earth and that no one loves them unconditionally. No one loves them the way I do. 
And, and also I see that no one loves me. And, and what I see on my kids' faces is I see that they've had to, they had to forget about me. It was too painful to remember me. And they weren't raised with, they weren't raised to be the compassionate, loving people that, that they are. I mean, they, they, they were raised in sort of a loveless world. And they, to protect themselves, they had to sort of shut a lot of things down about who they really were. And it was just, there was just this hollowness in their eyes. And the world for them had been really, really pretty sad. And I just could not stand it. I could not stand it. I thought, I've got to get back. I've got to get back to my kids. And it was just, I was so, I was desperate to get back. Now, getting back was not as easy as getting there. Getting there, I just had to, you know, go. You know, I was like, whatever. Getting back, I felt like I had to fight. I had to really fight to get back. I don't know exactly how I was fighting, but I was struggling to get back and saying, please, I gotta get back to my kids. I can't let that happen to them. And so I'm, I'm fighting, right? and then there, I got, like, sucked out. I was, like, sucked out, and the next thing I do, I'm waking up back in that hospital bed. There is, a, you know, and everything's super harsh now. Now the lights are harsh, the sounds are harsh, and I wake up, there's blood everywhere. And the nurses are completely panicked and stressed out. And, um, and they're just like, you gave us quite a scare. And I'm like, I'm sorry, you know, I apologize. I, I have no idea what's going on here in this room. No idea at all. And uh, they start, um, you know, the, the older nurse says, let's get you cleaned up. They move me from one bit, you know, onto a, like a gurney kind of thing. They just start cleaning everything up. They're cleaning everything up. They take all the, you know, blood-soaked linens and put them in a hamper and all this kind of stuff and clean everything up. Get me all kind of propped up, put, you know, set and straight. And they're like, we got to let your family in. They've been here for the whole time listening to this whole thing. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means. I have no idea what that could possibly mean. What does that mean they've been listening the whole time to what, you know? And... Eventually, they get things cleaned up enough that they that they uh, say, "Okay, we can let your family in." So they go to the door, they give them a thumbs up to come in, and the first ones that come in are my grandparents. And they come in, and they go, "Oh my God, we thought we were going to lose you." They called code blue twice, and they came rushing in here, and you know, and they're just completely just shot beside themselves. And um, and you know, they kiss me, and you know, goes and then my father-in-law comes in. He's just pale, he looks so sad, he's crying, he hugs me and kisses me and he goes and sits on the window ledge. The next thing comes in, my parents and my husband come in together. They don't say anything. They don't look at me, they don't talk to me. They're coming in a huddle and they go stand at the foot of my bed. They don't say anything. And it seems very strange to me. I'm like, that seems weird to me. I don't, you know, but I, you know, again, I'm sort of, I'm in a little bit delirious, I don't know. And I say out loud, I think I went to the other side. And my mother turns around, like, you know, turns, you know, she goes, you were on medication or you were something. She said something like just discounting it, I guess. And I never speak about it again. I never say another word about it again. And in fact, I, I, I pretty much forget about it until, uh, the only, I would, all I remember for a while is that it happened and that the reason I came back is because I knew my kids needed me. That was it. Uh, that's all I remembered. That's all I retained for a while. Um, then eventually, and what happened, what ensued after that was that my life went to, it became complete chaos. My life completely, it, I, so I, I lived, I survived. And what happened next was I watched everything about that life disappear. I watched every single aspect about my life be proven not to be true, like be, be taken, be dismantled, destroyed, stolen, whatever. And I watched the people that I devoted my life to doing it. So, you know, over the next four years, I essentially lose every single thing that, that told me about that life, told me who I was and that defined that life. And the only thing I have left are my two kids. The only thing I have left are my two kids. So after, you know, about year four, I'm at the, you know, my lowest, lowest, lowest point. I remember my near-death experience. I remember it happening. And what happens is also, I remember, I start remembering my childhood experiences, which had also been repressed. I had completely forgotten my childhood. Now that starts coming back. And I, so I remember, I remember this happening. I remember what I saw. I remember that the message was, 
you're gonna have a tough time, but you have everything you need. You have everything you need right in front of you already to win this war. You know, you may lose some battles, but you're gonna win the war. And what I understood that meant was that I have all this love. I have the, I have the unconditional love for my kids, for one thing, which is, makes me a fighter. Part of that also is that I have this unconditional love of spirit, of God, of this, of this, I am never alone. I have this spirit world, I have these people, this, I am, I am, I am beloved. And that there's this group of souls, spirits, angels, whatever they are, they're helping me and rooting for me. I'm not alone. I'm not alone. And there's more love than anything. And that love is what matters. More than anything else, love is what matters. And being loving in this world is what matters most of all. And that is how you create your afterlife world. Your afterlife world reflects how loving you've been in this world. I able, I'm actually, it becomes, it, the trajectory of my life completely changes. I'm able to change my life and turn it around. And I get, I start, basically I start putting in my mind that, that authority, that, that, that father figure is the one that really matters. I stop worrying about pleasing my parents who have, you know, completely betrayed me. I stop worrying about people that have betrayed me, that don't understand me, that don't know me, that don't in this world. And I focus solely on where I'm known, who I really truly am, and being, and not worrying about, not worrying about what happened in this, in this life. Which is hard to do because I've been very, I've been very betrayed and there has been no justice and it's been really, really incredibly unfair. And so I have to, I have to let that go and this gives me the power to do that for the most part. So that's it. That is my story, my near death experience story. Thank you so much for listening to it. And if you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section. I'd be happy to answer them. I'll answer them all. Thank you so much. Bye bye.